me today. I hope you're all ready to get your art on. So we want to start today's program by acknowledging that the program is taking place in the unceded territory of the Wallop Nation. My name is Nikki Madigan and I'm the curator at the Pemberton Museum and uh, we're very excited to have Wim here today. He's a well-known local artist and uh, he's brought some activities for us to all participate in. I just want to give you some context to what we're doing this season with the tales. So this is the second one so far out of seven. Um, we've got speakers from Birkin, Mount Curry, Pemberton and Squamish and our theme this year is local art, past and present. Come on in. <laughs> so what is art? Art is uh, defined as the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination, typically in the visual form, such as painting or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. But art also includes various branches of creative activity like painting, music, literature, and dance. Why is art important? Art reflects and informs the culture from which it comes from. Art created reflects a time and a place and the values and beliefs of that place. Art can be considered a mirror that's held up to inspire reflection on what is and also what was. In the past, local art wasn't the exception, it was the reality. Communicating and growing beyond local borders was largely impossible. Today we can communicate with nearly anyone, anywhere. However, it is local art that gives a community meaning and a sense of place, and so it remains an important aspect of any community. Art has the ability to share common values and beliefs between different groups of people. This type of communication is important. Creativity is a beautiful experience that brings people and communities together, regardless of race, gender, age, or religion. Integrating the arts more fully into our lives enriches each of us because engaging in the arts brings individuals together and it fosters community. This summer, uh, starting after uh, Win this week, we have Eric Anderson coming who's going to talk about uh, Emily Carr's travels through the, this area. Um, on July 30th, Levi Nelson, who's an up-and-coming Little Watt artist with recognition from the Emily Carr College, is here to talk about his need to create and how that inspires his art. Johnny Jones from the Little Watt Lands and Resources Department is going to be here after that to talk about rock painting, which would be the oldest tradition in the area. Uh, then we have the poet Linda K. Thompson, who's going to share poems inspired from her childhood up the Pemberton Meadows. And the final presentation museum staff are going to do, we're going to focus on three historic artists that were local, Marjorie Gims, Pat Wilson, and Rainey Roman. So just a reminder to everybody here that we do film these for the historical record and we make them available through our website. Today though, we're bringing Wim Twinkle into the museum and I just want to tell you a bit about Wim. He was born in the Netherlands and he studied forestry in Holland. He spent three years in Kenya and then he immigrated to Canada. After some time in Quebec and Ontario, he moved to British Columbia and settled in the Pemberton area in 1984 and also got to experience the 1984 flood. He's worked as a forester with the First Nations people of the region. He's traveled extensively all over the world and speaks several languages. In 2003, he authored the book Salish Elders. In 2009, he published Forest Life. And just recently, he's brought this, uh, the mute raven, living in the mountains of British Columbia. Wim is a well-known local artist. He is a creative person who has many outlets and titled this tale, Art, Just Do It, because that best expresses his creative journey. So please join us in welcoming Wim, and thank you for coming to participate today. Good, my time I guess. So you all know who I am. Most of you have seen me before because I've been here in the valley for what, like 40 years now, I guess, yeah? And uh, Nikki mentioned me as a visual artist. I will just show you some other work. And I purposely brought all kinds of different stuff that I have done in the past or are doing, rather than just one set of painting. Because I work in different medium, I guess. 
I get bored quickly and start with something else and go back. But, uh, but besides a visual artist, as some of you may know, I'm also a martial artist. I've been teaching karate here for you know, 35 years. Uh, so most of the time, two nights a week at least, sometimes more. And we've been forever at the uh, Signal Hill School. Uh, if you want to join us at Karate, it's every Mondays and Tuesdays, Mondays and Wednesdays from 7 to 9. And then we have junior class for And your age, look at me, <laughs> there's no objection. You can start, you do whatever you can, and help you stay in shape. It has helped me. Uh, when I moved here in, uh, well, permanently in 1984, I only had a brown belt, and I asked my karate teacher, can I start a club? He had taught teaching, and normally you don't do that until you at least black belt. And he said yes, because the reason I did that is I figured one of these days I'm going to get old. <laughs> and if I'm the teacher of the karate club, I have no choice, I've got to go there. <laughs> well, I'm old and I have to go to karate, even though I don't feel like it. So, uh, but it has been a great experience. I once figured I've had it, including the, the, the First Nation Reserve and Pemberton had about 3% of the population in my karate classes one time or another. And it happens so often that some young guy, or even not so young anymore, came up to me, oh yeah, you remember I was in your karate class. A thousand years ago, when he was a little kid, I don't remember him. <laughs> but anyway, um, talk about your art. Oh, and I guess, so I'm a visual artist, work with different media, I'm a martial artist, and uh, I guess there are some people that have not called me a con artist, but that's fake news, don't believe it. <laughs> um, I have traveled all over the world, and Nikki mentioned that I spent three years in, uh, in Kenya. Actually, I spent two and a half years, and then with a friend from Kenya, uh, I bought a Land Rover and flew down to the campus. That was before campus were ubiquitous. So we traveled for six months throughout Africa. That was a great trip. So from Kenya, we went to South Africa, along the West Coast, through the Sahara back, and we just parked anywhere. In the morning we wake up, there'd be a whole bunch of kids looking at us through the windows. <laughs> but the funny thing is that I was like, tell us, several years ago now I was uh, on a ski lift in Whistler, going up, and there was this guy and two girls and myself and four on the chairlift, and the guy was telling the girls, well, wow, next year I'm going to go on a safari to Africa in the truck, right? And for a moment I really felt jealous, I said, wow, wouldn't it be great? And then I realized, wait, I did that 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, uh, the trip that really was, when in those days it was a lot safer, there were not as many people. And, um, and then often people ask me why I came to Canada from Holland, because I was born in Holland and I always kind of knew I didn't want to stay there. Uh, I'm trained as a forester and in Holland. There's some forest there, and every forest has three forests standing around it. <laughs> so I wanted to come to emigrate, and I'm not sure why I decided there are two possibilities. I'll either go to Chile or to Canada. And I remember it, well, kind of I remember the day that I decided that because we were traveling, as I told we were traveling through Africa, we were traveling through the Congo. Most of it we did uh, on the ferry, but I remember driving on this dirt road, and the roads are really, were really bad, and I'm sure they're still really bad there. There's a towering jungle on both sides of us, and I started thinking, what am I going to do? And I mean, a couple of months' time, back in Holland, where am I going to go? So, it's either Chile or Canada. And I thought about it, I said, you know what? I'm going to go to Canada. Because if in Canada, I'm going to earn dollars. And I can go to Chile any time I want. If I go to Chile, I'm earning pesos. You'll never get out of the country. Never get out. <laughs> so I went to Canada. I'm happy I did because I really like Canada. And for those of you who know where I live, and that is uh, halfway between Mercury and Darcy, just 
this side of Gates Lake, there is this big raven sign there, the new raven is my gallery, and uh, it's a beautiful place. Like Mary Jo, my wife and I, we built our own house. That's all I could do it in a year. It took uh, six years before we finished it. <laughs> and never mind, it was fun doing it. That's kind of funny. It was working in Vancouver, it took a year of, well, I could build a house in a year, right? So uh, the first three months, because we didn't have that much money, we had to do it all cheap. The first three months I spent making shakes for the roof. Mm -hmm. And later on I realized I had to carry every damn shake up the roof. Nearly done. <laughs> But we, 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 like, we like our place, it's beautiful, and I like Canada. And uh, there is a, we'll be playing a video that uh, flew out that you can look at later on, and we'll turn on the sound. And this is a bit of an aside, but is a, actually it fits right in here in the kind of, I mean, art, just do it. But 10 years ago I decided, I was a karate instructor, we need another karate movie because after the karate kid, karate was really popular and then it became, uh, what do you call it? It's a Chinese one shoe. And uh, I decided to need a karate, so I wrote a script for a karate movie. Basically, the girls was, as the uh, protagonist in the, in the movie and uh, sent it out to a few people, nothing happened. But then after the uh, what a year ago, I got in touch with a friend. He said, oh, let's make a movie. And we decided to make a movie. We didn't have any money or anything. And he didn't quite keep up his end. So he, but in the end, I got together with two people here in Pemberton called Prime Vision. That's uh, Jasmine Chen and uh, Radek Hodovic. And they're professional movie makers. They mostly make documentaries. And we're going to make a movie together. We're now waiting for a Curry to give us permission to use their cultural health assets, like the dance and the song. But uh, that is a short movie. It's a preparation for the movie. And it's, uh, I'm afraid, mostly about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of cute because I'll be the officially, I'm not the film director, but I'll be officially the uh, producer of the movie, and I'm the script writer, and I'm an actor. I'm not an actor, but I just happen to be the karate teacher in there, so I just have to be my natural self. So uh, that will be playing, and you can have a look at it at your leisure. So let's get back to uh, what I'm here for, visual arts. I've run a whole bunch of stuff, like I said, and I'm going to go through it, all the different things. And purposely, I've got all the different ones. This one here, actually I didn't bring it for here, it's... Uh, <coughs> Ryan Zandt is supposed to be here because he bought this one. This is one curry from uh, Pool Creek. So that's close to where I live. If you, you may have seen it, if you drive through it, the clear cut. It used to be Victor Prochaska's property. And when you cut all the streets, the mountain became really nicely visible. So that's why I painted it. So this is in acrylic on canvas. So Ryan is supposed to pick that up. And by the way, all this stuff is all for sale. Um, let me offer. <laughs> the Sailor's Elders book is out of print. It's about the Elders. I decided to, because besides a painter, I'm also a photographer. So, 15 years ago, I decided I worked together with a lot of the First Nations people. I got my forester and I managed their forest. And the generation of people and a little bit older that I was working with was the last ones who were born in the old way. Like their parents lived very much still in the style that they were used to, their grandparents used to. And these are still the people, most of them that speak the native language. And I realized that was the last generation. So I decided to take pictures of them. And all I did portrait pictures. And, took a, and I knew most of them, and I felt very comfortable, like they all heard of me, and we just sat down, and I let them talk. I taped it, and I went home and transcribed it, and I basically used their words. Okay, that's the one here, right? So this one be really reprinted. This one here, Forest Life. Does anybody know what a woodlot is? An official woodlot? I used to have one up around uh, Ivy Lake there. And it's a piece of land 
uh, that time 600, now it's 800 to 1200 hectares that you lease from the government, uh, the forest, and you got to maintain it. So, and you can, you're allowed to cut enough wood so that you can maintain the supply of wood continuously. So it might be like a thousand cubic meters a year because that grows back every year. Um, but I'm still a member of the, uh, the Woodlot Association and they commissioned me to make a book about woodlots. So I had to travel all over the province, take pictures of people, and the cool thing is, in the woodlot you can't make enough money to make a living off, so all those people knew something different. Like they had the woodlot for the love of it, because they liked forestry, and then they could do, if need be, some other job. So it makes for really interesting people. So that was a great job, to go all over the place. And a few years ago, because of my karate, I've been doing karate all over the world, teaching. I got a lot of foreign visitors, so we decided to make a little book that we could hand out to visitors as a souvenir. And that's this one. New Dragon is my gallery. You can have a look at it. And it's all about our life, life there. So there's actually a, uh, does anybody know Nikki Segovia? Yeah. yeah. Yes, she's going to make a little documentary about me. She's living in the mountains. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the other. So what I had in mind, <laughs> I'm talking to this, I'm running out of time. So I'm going to go very quickly through the different things. And what I would like to do is all find a seed, you can paint, paint with acrylics, watercolor, you can uh, draw, I've got charcoal and pastels, color pencils, and for the really meat, there is a, a coloring book that people use. It's very, I, I never use it because I'm not very good at painting between the lines. But uh, it's a drawn out piece of paper and you just fill in with colors. And it's very relaxing to do. So you can try that, whatever makes you fancy. So I work with different things. The one I showed you before, and this one, this is uh, Mount Kenya, uh, left in East Africa. I could tell you some stories about this look. This is acrylic. And acrylic is great paint. Uh, it dries out very quickly. So we have to, we don't have to work fast, but if you leave it an hour, two hours, it's dry as compared to uh, oil, oil colors, which take several days to dry out. But the nice thing about acrylic is you just go to the tap and use water to clean your brush. So it's, uh, Nice forgiving uh, medium, and it's very bright colors. You can do so much with it. Um, this is the top of my key, and the, this is way of trees look really weird. So that's the regular painting, and oh, okay. Here's another little painting. It's a little one. And this one I painted years ago with a knife. Uh, yeah. So, it doesn't always have to be painting. This is India ink. This is my wife sleeping. You know, spinning it. And it just, you just, it's basically a drawing with India ink. So, uh, I didn't bring any ink, but you, it doesn't always have to be a brush or ink. You, know, you can use a pen. You can do in art. You do whatever you want. And then when you finish, it always looks better if you put a frame on it. <laughs> and no matter how it looks, you hang it on the wall and you call it art. And nobody can gain it. So, I've got a different ways. Um, so you can do it. Pencil, right? You can make it. And some people get really good at it. You know, I can find what I was looking for. Oh, this, sometimes you get really ugly paintings. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that depends very much on the subject matter. <laughs> so our charcoal is a very nice medium too. It can be soft, it can be hard. You know, afterward you have to spray it to fix it to the surface, otherwise it's smear out. But it's easy way. Like it doesn't have to be fancy, right? You buy these for a few bucks and a couple of Charcoal sticks, 
and you go in it, whatever your ability. Like my wife likes to say, uh, for me, lack of talent has never stopped him doing anything. So. These are made while we were living in Japan in 1978. This is called basically Sumiya. And the funny thing about Japanese art, the white spaces are just as important as what's drawn. Right? So it can be very simple, and most of Japanese art is, as compared especially with Chinese, are very simple stuff. And I kind of like this open space. And it doesn't take much effort to make one because no one will win it. Okay, um, next. Watercolor. There are different ways you, you can use watercolor. The acrylics, you can just by adding enough water, you can make a watercolor. You usually use special paper, I didn't bring any, but there are some tubes with watercolor and you just fix paint with water and paint it. And it runs all over. But you can use that also to in your art, right? It doesn't always have to be straight lines. So we're going to go on Then caustics. I had everything set up for the table on caustics to be wax and I left it at home. So you put it in caustics and go to my own. Which is basically bee wax. You take an iron, and this one was just done with an iron, like to nothing else. You heat it up, take a little cube of uh, bee wax with color in it, melt it, and you put it on there. There are in Egypt and some of the, the pyramids, there are tombs with portraits that are 2,000 years old, and of course there's no sunlight, and they're still as brilliant and colorful as they were when they were painted. And of course you've got to be careful that you don't hang this in full sun. <laughs> so you can make a, this is just abstract, but you can make either with a brush or with an iron or a combination of it, also a landscape or whatever you want to paint. Right? This is just a fantasy land. I always paint tree. I like painting lots of trees. And then finally, this one called mixed media and it's a photograph. This is a yellow-headed cowbird. I made a photograph, I put it on the, on the background, put beeswax over it, then I glued the grass in it and put some more beeswax over it. I have made several different ones. There is a, that one that I really like in this one. That was the mountain goat a little wet, you know, with the rock faces. And a picture of a mountain goat. It's actually in the uh, Forest life book, and I put some flat rocks underneath. And that was beautiful, beautiful thing. Okay, so that's basically uh, it for my talk. Let's go to that. So I think we've got half an hour, but I'd like you all to do something.